and we are live. Welcome everyone to today's edition of The Parlor, or episode rather. Uh, I am joined by my co-host Matthew Lina, and we will be going once again into Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, today we will be doing chapters 27 and 30. 27, the virtuous, and 30, the famous wise ones. So today we are going to uh, get started. Let me get into the chat so I can talk to you all in there. And once I'm in the chat, I will be able to begin reading from the book and commenting on it, as is the R process here in these streams. Okay. First, we're going to be discussing Thus Spake Zarathustra, Chapter 27, The Virtuous. I'll put the link into the uh, video chat for any of you who are interested in following along. Just open that up in a new tab. It's not like we have anything too interesting for you to see in this tab besides the chat and the lovely picture of Nietzsche. So if you prefer to read along, have at it. All right, and I see we now have three viewers already. Welcome, everyone. And let's get started. Chapter 27 of Thus Spake Zarathustra, The Virtuous. With thunder and heavenly fireworks must one speak to indolent and somnolent senses. But beauty's voice speaketh gently, it appealeth only to the most awakened souls. Gently vibrated and laughed unto me today, my buckler. It was beauty's holy laughing and thrilling. At you, ye virtuous ones, laughed my beauty today. And thus came its voice unto me. They want to be paid besides. Ye want to be paid besides, ye virtuous ones? Ye want reward for virtue in heaven for earth and eternity for your today? And now ye upbraid me for teaching that there is no reward giver nor paymaster, and verily I do not even teach that virtue is its own reward. Ah, oh, this is my sorrow. Into the basis of things have reward and punishment been insinuated, and now even into the basis of your souls, ye virtuous ones. So there's a lot to unpack already. With thunder and heavenly fireworks must one speak to indolent and somnolent ones, and somnolent senses. But beauty's voice speaketh gently, it appealeth only to the most awakened souls. Now what Nietzsche is saying here is that if a person is a bit dull of comprehension, or does not have very, uh, let's say, refined, or, uh, or delicate aesthetic sensibilities... You have to kind of set off some fireworks to get their attention and keep it. Whereas really beautiful things require an acute apprehension that is a bit rare. So, uh, and now Nietzsche is talking about the virtue or the kind of moral, the attitudes toward morality that I'm guessing he's referring specifically to those present in 19th century Germany, which we can recall uh, is the milieu in which Nietzsche was writing. Now, teaching that virtue is its own reward is a way of sort of conning people into being virtuous. The truth is, is that you want to be virtuous for the sake of virtue, not because it's even a reward, but barely because being virtuous is the right thing. Although Nietzsche may disagree with me on that point, he being a... Uh, anti-realist about morality. It's not that he may disagree with you on that point. He does disagree with you on that point. Well, he would disagree with me about what right means. He would say that it's different for each person, but that you should pursue your virtue and let it be ineffable just for the sake of doing so. But he yes, would say your virtue. And then if everyone is pursuing each and every person's virtue, then eventually maybe somebody becomes the Superman. Right. <laughs> Correct. Now, but like the snout of the boar, shall my word grub up the basis of your souls. A plowshare will I be called by you. All the secrets of your heart shall be brought to light. And when ye lie in the sun, 
grubbed up and broken, then will also your falsehood be separated from your truth. For this is your truth. Ye are too pure for the filth of the words, vengeance, punishment, re recompense, retribution. Remember Nietzsche says he wants man to be redeemed from revenge. Ye love your virtue as a mother loveth her child, but when did one hear of a mother wanting to be paid for her love? So what Nietzsche is saying is, is well, within you, the reason you love your virtue is because you have to. Uh, there is no reward nor punishment, although I would add to that, I, Caleb, would add to that. There is a reward for it, but the reward is not the point. <laughs> it is your dearest self, your virtue. You are your virtue, says Nietzsche, says Zarathustra, or Nietzsche by way of Zarathustra. The ring's thirst is in you. To reach itself again, every again struggleth every ring and turneth itself. Remember, Nietzsche also uses the phrase a self-rolling wheel. And like the star that goeth out, so is every work of your virtue. Ever is its light on its way and traveling, and when will it cease to be on its way? And I, I think the answer to that rhetorical question is never. Thus is the light of your virtue still on its way. Even when its work is done, be it forgotten and dead, still its ray of light liveth and traveleth. Nietzsche says one must still have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. And the chaos in yourself is the straining of that ring that you are to reach back to itself and sort of reach completion of its virtue. That your virtue is yourself, and so chaos in yourself is chaos in your virtue, discord, and not an outward thing, a skin or a cloak. That is the truth from the basis of your souls, ye virtuous ones. But sure enough, there are those to whom virtue meaneth writhing under the lash, and ye have hearkened too much unto their crying. Who are these people to whom virtue means writhing under the lash, to whom it means suffering and punishment, these people that worship suffering and failure? And others are there who call virtue the slothfulness of their vices, and when once their hatred and jealousy relax the limbs, their justice becometh lively and rubbeth its sleepy eyes. Okay, so you basically have people engaged in either literal or figurative self-flagellation. In fact, there have been, and these actually wound up taking place in, roughly in millennial intervals uh, and, uh, and intervals of 500 years from uh, AD zero, right? So people got this idea that, uh, you know, Jesus is going to come back. Uh, so let's beat ourselves with rods, whip ourselves with whips, uh, scourge ourselves and hope that somehow that winds up being something that's pleasing to God. So there's this idea of preparing yourself. So let's, let's, let's engage in real self-flagellation. And there are the other people that just think, well, uh, I'm only virtuous insofar as I go and tell everybody how horrible I am, which is interesting because it actually parallels very closely with something that you just, just wrote on Quora. Specifically, the whole Calvinist idea of of of, of original sin and complete the, the, this idea that that um, we all are are completely depraved and um, how this particular idea this this depravity can get ostensibly by nature of human nature. Uh, put into many aspects of life. For instance, uh, SJW types going and saying people who are of a privileged caste or uh, who, who who need to check their privilege can somehow redeem themselves by admitting they're privileged and becoming one of the oppressed. You know, Nietzsche would probably have this exact same kind of a thing to say to these sorts of people. Um, but Writhing under the lash isn't the only form of virtue. That's just one way of dealing with self-loathing. 
the others, of course, the slothfulness of their vices that say, well, okay, well, I'm just too weak or too lazy or what have you in order to do anything bad, so I'm just going to kind of be a neutral, non-playable character and call that virtue. So this writhing under the lash, this sort of messianic uh, moral vanity, is not specific to Christianity. It can be, it can be done and is done in a secular fashion. Oh, was I not clear enough about that? You were perfectly clear, but I heard that repetition was the mother of all learning. I see. So basically what you're trying to say is that it, it might behoove us to go ahead and say again that uh, currently this sort of a thing is very much uh, evident in the behavior of uh people who blindly advocate for social justice in terms of, of course, understanding the world as being uh, understood under the framework of there only being two kinds of people, the oppressed and the oppressors, and that oppressors need to hate themselves and repent of their oppressive ways and self-flagellate and become part of the oppressed in order to somehow atone for their oppressive nature it's not even oppressive behavior but oppressive nature so like because of our gender or skin or income or uh, geographical uh, situation or citizenship or ancestry or whatever all of these different things make us who we are and if we happen to be wrong in some aspect well then that's what we need to beat ourselves up over Right. So this self-flagellating sort of Calvinistic sentiment that comes about, you know, 500-year intervals or so, Sims AD 0, this is showing up in the current time in a secular fashion, particularly with the American and the European left. And you'll notice that in countries, uh, in countries where Calvinism is weaker, this stuff is weaker. It doesn't show up as badly in, uh, for example, France. Because France was never a Calvinist country. It was never a Protestant country. In Japan, it's non-existent. Even though Japan is an advanced first world liberal democracy, well, quote-unquote, advanced. So this stuff can be done in a secular, not a religious fashion, and it does have to do with this idea that you're born broken and have to repent, and you can't possibly argue with it because that's not valid. Your, you know, your arguments are tainted by your original sin or privilege, you know, two sides, not even two sides of the same coin, the same side of the same coin, just with a different gloss on it. Because a false doctrine uh, like Calvinism in the, in the religious or the political realm is quite flexible and can show up anywhere. Now... And others are there who call the virtue the slothfulness of their vices. We've read that. And others are there who are drawn downwards. Their devils draw them. But the more they sink, the more ardently gloweth their eye and the longing for their god. Ah, their crying also hath reached your ears, ye virtuous ones. What I am not, that, that is god to me and virtue. Because uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and read this quote. It was from a feminist professor. Uh, she said, she was white, My white skin disgusts me. My passport disgusts me. They are the marks of an insufferable privilege brought, bought at the price of others' agony. If I could peel myself inside out, I would be glad. If I could become part of the oppressed, I would be free. Her name was Robin Morgan. And you can Google that to verify it. To verify that quote, Robin Morgan said all that. Now, what does that mean? What I am not, that is God to me in virtue. To the sort of, uh, to the sort of social justice he left, to the sort of, uh, to, to, to the identity politicians, as you might call them, to the people who revere this sort of thing, the oppressed are like saints and the oppressors are sinners, and the best the oppressors can do is flagellate themselves and follow the saints, the oppressed. 
what I am not that is oppressed because I'm an oppressor, that, that is God to me in virtue. Now, that's merely how this particular narrative plays itself out in this time, but you can see it playing out in different, in different fashions all throughout the course of history. You know, people... In the Middle Ages, uh, can you tell us what a flagellant is, Matt? Ah, who they well, were. People that well, literally beat themselves up and scourged themselves more often than not with, uh, with, with whips and chains. They would, uh, I- in order to express their not, not only hatred for their own behavior, but hatred for who they are, their self loathing, uh, they would, without prompting by anybody else, sometimes alone, sometimes in groups, uh, sew bits of of glass and uh, and uh, metal into leather straps and whip themselves until they shredded the muscle fibers of their backs. Uh, they would go for prolonged periods of time without bathing or food or uh, very little to drink, just basically barely enough to keep themselves together. And they would go all from town in, to town doing this so everyone could see. Yes, and, and they would try to get other people to join them because obviously it would somehow... I mean, they're not going to say it validates what we're doing, but they, 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 they believed... I mean, people really didn't go along with it. It was, it was mostly people that just kind of came up with this idea that, oh, well, you see other people doing it, and oh, yeah, we think that we're horrible. So, you know, a few months down the line when I start feeling really, really terrible about myself, well, I guess I'll go do that. But they need the validation of other people, paradoxically. Oh, you are you're 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 beating yourself up over how bad you are. Well, you must really be good because you're beating yourself up so much. You can like the the measure of pain that you inflict on yourself on account of your perceived inadequacies or real inadequacies um, is commensurate with the amount of redemption or honor or whatever it is that you receive or ostensibly receive on the flip side. Um, the most recent of the of the uh, flagrant uh, uh, flagellates were was in the uh, 18th century, if I recall correctly. But it really, really tended to happen in in 500 year intervals, along with a whole bunch of other weird preparatory behavior, so to speak, because people were somehow thinking that you know, Jesus is going to come back and he likes to see us whip ourselves. So ultimately it was done, done to win God's favor, but then there was the, 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 the social element that everyone knows exists, right? I'm, 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 I'm doing this. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm checking my privilege nowadays. I'm checking my privilege, so now you can all see how no, I'm really joining the oppressed said, even though I'm not, by checking my privilege. And, oh boy, aren't I virtuous for checking my privilege? I recognize all these different privileges that I have, and I, whereas I'm going to utilize them to the fullest extent in my own lives, just because I acknowledge it and I talk about it and so on, uh, I'm somehow absolved from them. Even though it wouldn't necessarily be something bad in and of itself, I still have to beat myself up over it. Right. Oh, if only I could be a different color. If only I could be a different gender. If only I could be from a different place. It's like, well, no, you don't really want that, but it's what you you say you want. It's what you, you, you convey to everybody else that you want. The more they sink, the more ardently gloweth their eye and the longing for their God. So the question is, is their God really this... You know, for instance, for the social justice types, is their God really, I want to go and become part of the oppressed ed, or is it really, I want people to notice me and to validate me for checking my privilege? So again, I would, I would suggest that it's the latter. I would highly suggest that it's the latter. 
Yes, and moreover, um... One moment. Okay. Well, while you're doing that, I'll, 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 Moreover. I'll, of course. Okay. Um, I, I did want to say that that was literally one moment, not I'm going to take five minutes. <laughs> I know I do that. Um, and others are there who go along heavily and creakingly, like carts taking stones downhill, laden down with stones. They talk much of dignity and virtue. Their drag they call virtue. So just imagine a cart, and, and, and of course the hill doesn't necessarily need to be this paved thing, but it can be, you know, soggy ground. So when, so when you have a cart that's laden, even though you're going downhill, you still run into troubles from time to time. You still get stuck. And then once you get unstuck, the cart just goes headlong until you hit a rocket. Well. And others are there who, like, eight-day clocks, when wound up, they tick and want people to call ticking virtue. So, you know, this idea that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a human being and that's enough, or I um, want to be praised for the things that are merely my responsibility, you know. I'll, I'll give an example. The, the person that goes and says, well, at least I don't beat my wife. It's like, that's basic. That, 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 that's, that, that's a basic element of interaction. It's like, that's not praiseworthy. Not beating your wife is not praiseworthy. Well, at least I take care of my kids. No, that's not praiseworthy. That's the bare minimum. What do you want, a cookie? No, they probably want a freaking sticker. I mean, a cookie, oh. I mean, yeah, they might want oh, the sugar shop. Oh, we should talk the... about NPCs next. Oh, yes. Holy crap, I am going to note this with a pencil in the margin. I am going to actually note this in the margin of my copy, because this is just too good to pass up. You oh, yeah. You all the talk about NPCs, people who just, uh, you know, repeat these sort of political opinions and have none of their own. They're sort of programmed. And others there are there who are like eight-day clocks when wound up. They tick and want people to call ticking virtue. Verily, in those have I mine amusement. Wherever I find such clocks, I shall wind them up with my mockery, and they shall even whir thereby. Because if you find someone who is one of these, uh, what you might call an NPC, you know, this, this, inter this derogatory internet meme that's been going around about people who are just sort of programmed to think things. The non-playable character. Yes. That's what they are. They're one of these eight-day clocks that's just wound up. Just going through life completely on autopilot, expecting to get rewarded at every turn for barely skating by. I'll, I, and and just in case I haven't been offensive enough, and Caleb, you can tell me to shut up if you think I'm getting too offensive and would, this would be bad for your channel, so please do bear that in mind. But just in case I'm not being offensive enough, let's talk about men that whine about not being able to get a date. Go on. So there exist, or at least... I've heard of their existence. There are these people that that, that 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 claim, I'm a nice guy, I don't see why no one will date me. And uh, to anybody with any sense, they can go and say, I see exactly why no one will date you. Um, and the reason is very simple. Well, I'm nice, and, and being nice is, of course... Uh, it's 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 a veiled term. It actually means being an unplayable character. It means being a milk toast. It means not standing up for anything. It means not rocking the boat, so to speak. If you have an opinion, and let's say you decide to 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 chat up some girl, right? Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm interested. You know, whatever it might be, just 
you know, pretend for a moment that I'm single so that I was it's like, hello, I'm, I'm Matthew. I'm, I'd like to get to know you a little better. Right. And then wh whatever kind of conversation takes place. And if I were to just agree, blindly agree with everything that whoever it is that I'm trying to pick up says, I'm nothing but a yes man. I'm, I have no substance. I'm unprincipled. I am completely unprincipled. I don't have an opinion of my own. And even if I have, it's not like it's going to have any real impact. It's not like it's actually going to be doing anybody any good. Because it's not like I am comfortable enough in my own skin to live my own life. I mean, on, the, on, 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 on the contrary, I royally pissed off my wife on, on numerous occasions while we were dating. I had different ideas about how the world went than she had. She grew up in, um, well, as, a, as, as, as essentially a social democrat in, in Finland. And, uh, well, that was about as far from what I am as possible. And so I would challenge her worldview at every single turn, right? It, uh, whatever it was that I was talking with her was not to, for instance, try to appease her with the non-threatening nature of my words in order to get into her pants. I was just having a real conversation about real topics, letting my real opinion be known. And she discovered as a consequence that whether my principles are right or wrong, at least I'm a principled person and I'm trustworthy, I'm honest, that I would, I, I would actually say what was on my mind. Now, could I misarticulate something? Certainly. Could I be wrong? Certainly. But, the, but I wasn't going to just, I wasn't just going to say what I thought she wanted to hear. That that uh, and, and on one hand, for instance, small talk. There's a there's a place for it. The place for small talk is, of course, to quickly go into, or, or or to ascertain threat levels and then go into real conversation, right? But if all you can ever do, and all you ever dare do, is uh, talk about the nature of the weather, or whether or not the hometown sports team was winning or losing or what have you, and all you ever know how to do is say, "Fine, thanks. How are you?" Or uh, do you take uh, sugar or milk or cream with your coffee or tea? It's like if that's if that's all that if that's all that you can muster up, you're pathetic. All and, right. Uh, may I read a bit more because I'm really anxious to get to this next section here. You're talking the 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 third chapter thirty or the next section of this. Next section of this. Ah. And others are proud of their modicum of righteousness, and <laughs> for the sake of it do violence to all things, so that the world is drowned in their unrighteousness. Ah, how ineptly cometh the word virtue out of their mouth. And when they say, I am just, it always soundeth like, I am just, revenged. With their virtues, they want to scratch out the eyes of their enemies, and they elevate themselves only that they may lower others. Which, in uh, two chapters from now, and we'll cover this at some point, the tarantulas in chapter 29. We've covered it twice already. Have we covered it in this series? No. Okay, so we're going to cover it in this series for a third time, because it's my favorite chapter. <laughs> uh, in chapter 29, he says... He, he, there are people he calls tarantulas, and he says, Otherwise, however, would the tarantulas have it? Let it be very justice for the world to become full of the storms of our vengeance. Thus do they talk to one another. Vengeance will we use and insult against all who are not like us. And will to equality, that itself shall henceforth be the name of virtue. And against all that hath power will we raise an outcry. Ye preachers of equality, the tyrant frenzy of impotence crieth thus in you for equality. 
Your most secret tyrant longings disguise themselves if thus in virtue words. That's who he's talking about here, the tarantulas. They're SJWs. Yes. And it, 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 this actually reminds me of um, one of those lovely hell anecdotes. You know, the, the person getting the tour of hell, so to speak. Uh, this was during uh, the, the Cold War era. And uh, this one person shows up to hell and is, is welcomed by the devil. And there, there, there are three different cauldrons he can choose to jump into. Like one is the cauldron with the Americans, the other is the cauldron uh, with the Brits, and the other was the cauldron with the Soviets. And so he went and he looked at the cauldron with the Americans, and periodically people would be trying to, you know, swim up out of the cauldron, and they, and they would get to the end, and then a demon would go knock them back in. And the Brits had the same thing going on as the Americans, except they wouldn't try as hard or as often to get up out of the pit or to get up out of the cauldron. And then the guy goes and sees that uh, the Soviet cauldron doesn't have anybody guarding it. And he says, well, I think I'll go into the Soviet cauldron. So he goes into the Soviet cauldron and then realizes that the reason there isn't a guard is because every single time anybody tries to get out, everybody else pulls them back in. <laughs> Does that mindset sound familiar, dear viewers? Does it sound familiar? I don't know. And again, Does there it? are those who sit in their swamp and speak thus from among the bulrushes. Virtue, that is to sit quietly in the swamp. Oh, wow. Or the cauldron. We bite no one and go out of the way of him who would bite, and in all matters we have the opinion that is given us. And again, there are those who love attitudes and think that virtue is a sort of attitude. Their knees continually adore and their hands are eulogies of virtue, but their heart knoweth not thereof. And again, there are those who regard it as virtue to say virtue is necessary, but after all, they believe only that policemen are necessary. And many a one who cannot see men's loftiness calleth it virtue to see their baseness far too well. Thus calleth he his evil eye virtue. Uh, the eternal critic, the eternal uh, pin pusher. And some want to be edified and raised up and call it virtue, but others want to be and others want to be cast down and likewise call it virtue. And thus do almost all think that they participate in virtue, and at least every one claimeth to be an authority on good and evil. But Zarathustra came not to say unto all these liars and fools, What do ye know of virtue? What could ye know of virtue? But that ye, my friends, might become weary of the old words which ye have learned from the fools and liars. That ye might become weary of the words reward, retribution, punishment, and righteous vengeance. That ye might become weary of saying that an action is good because it is unselfish. Ah, my friends, that your very self be in your action. As the mother is in the child, let that be your formula of virtue. Verily have I taken from you a hundred formulae and your virtue's favorite playthings, and now ye upbraid me as children upbraid. They played by the sea, then came there a wave and swept their playthings into the deep, and now do they cry. But the same wave shall bring them new playthings and spread before them new speckled shells. Thus will they be comforted, and like them shall ye also, my friends, have your comforting and new speckled shells. Thus spoke Zarathustra. <laughs> All right, uh, yes, and part of what we do in this stream is to allow two waves, the first one to take away all your favorite playthings, and the second to bring you some new speckled shells. Yeah, especially if these playthings happen to be things that involve wonderful hooks that we use to, to, to pull people back into a, into a cauldron or a cesspit or what have you. And we take those away and replace them with new speckled shells that you will find can be used to uh, 
build wings. The people, uh, okay, now we're going to go to chapter 30. The famous wise ones. The people have ye served in the people's superstition, not the truth. All ye famous wise ones. And just on that account did they pay you reverence. Right there, I got something I want to say. The modern world provides no shortage of experts. Crack open any book, any website, any, any you know, news media, and you'll see, according to experts, according to, you know, expert Bob Finkel, who has a blaster baiter's degree in mustelid fuckatology from Big Swinging Dick University, and is therefore qualified to speak on this matter, despite the fact that his discipline is a pseudoscience, you know, that sort of thing. And really all these people do is, one, forward the agendas of the people who, uh, who give them a platform, and two, they serve your prejudices and validate your prejudices. So A, he who pays the piper calls the tune, and B, they're not uh, bringers of unwelcome tidings. Because as we learned previously, if you are the bringer of unwelcome news, no matter how you bring it, you're going to be hated. So basically these people are, well, paid mouthpieces that say what one's itching ears want to hear. Precisely. And on that account, did they, did also, did they tolerate your unbelief? Because it was a pleasantry and a bypath for the people. Thus doth the master give free scope to his slaves, and even enjoyeth their presumptuousness. But he who is hated by the people as the wolf by the dogs, is the free spirit, the enemy of fetterers, the non-adorer, the dweller in the woods. Flee into thy solitude from the flies of the marketplace in an earlier chapter. Yeah, that's uh, chapter 12. Which, interestingly, we haven't covered in this series either. So we're we'll have going to, to cover we'll, them. We'll have to do flies and tarantulas together. Yes. Obviously. Yes. Yes. Flies, and tarantulas, plaster this and all goblins, over social oh my. Flies and tarantulas, like literally plaster this all over social media. Next Thursday we're doing flies and tarantulas. Put it on your Facebook, put it on your Twitter. I guarantee you're going to have some fun. Uh, and in preparation, uh, Jordan Peterson actually did a reading of the tarantulas. So you can check that out on his channel before the stream on the, uh, before the stream next Thursday. To hunt him out of his lair, that was always called sense of right by the people. On him do they still hound their sharpest tooth dogs. For there the truth is where the people are. Woe, woe to the seeking ones, thus hath it echoed through all time. You can't trust your own, uh, your own reasoning because it's tainted by the patriarchy and racism and so forth. Truth is whatever I learned in college. Yes, truth is whatever the collective believes the, the famous is. wise ones well yes the famous wise ones are the ones that claim to know the will of the collective precisely you know there there, there are such people that that, that that did that sort of thing in the 20th century i think you know there's chairman mao or, or, or stalin or lenin or hitler you know, people like that
Your people would ye justify in their reverence. That called ye will to truth, ye famous wise ones. And your heart hath always said to itself, From the people have I come, from thence came to me also the voice of God. Because if everybody says it's true, it's a divine dictate, right? Or at least some sort of a an undeniable truth of the human condition, as people would say. You know, people that talk about cultural evolution, that if, if there's a meme that's pervasive enough, that must mean that it contains some sort of undeniable truth. Maybe an insight, but I definitely wouldn't necessarily say truth. Stiff-necked and artful like the ass have ye always been as the advocates of the people. And many a powerful one who wanted to run well with the people hath harnessed in front of his horses a donkey, a famous wise man. And now, ye famous wise ones, I would have you finally throw off entirely the skin of the lion, the skin of the beast of prey, the speckled skin, and the disheveled locks of the investigator, the searcher, and the conqueror. Because these... Ah. Oh. For me to learn to believe in your conscientiousness, ye would first have to break your venerating will. Yes. All these famous experts that one reads about are sort of tools of people who have the money to give them platforms. And they wear the skin of a lion and act all, you know, sort of a brave and powerful and they're investigators and, uh, you know, grizzled researchers and so forth. But underneath of that, as soon as you peel off that skin, all you hear is hee-haw, hee-haw, because they're a jackass. Well, yes, and that's why it's very, very important to follow the money. I mean, of course you'll have people going and saying, well, it doesn't actually matter. And, um, and you know, the whole idea of he who pays the piper calls the tune is, um, is, is, is hogwash. I'm beyond that. Well, certainly it's possible to be beyond that, but it's a whole lot more rare than people would like you to think. Not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying that it's rare. Politicians, journalists, all sorts of people that are in the public eye touting a particular perspective, especially one that seems to be ubiquitously accepted. Notice I say seems to be. I don't say that the silent majority even necessarily agrees with it, but it's put into such a light as it's, as it's supposed to seem ubiquitously expe accepted gotta look at who's writing their paycheck and who's telling them to do the talking sensation sells sensationalism sells and that gives people or at least it seemingly gives people the right to say whatever it is that they want to say in order to be able to perpetuate whatever crazy idea they want to perpetuate in order to get more of whatever it is that they want, be it money, power, what have you. And so the best way of dealing with them is to not play into their hands, to fact check things yourself, to perhaps even do a gut check, a reality check thinking whether or not something is actually true and perhaps realizing that if something is an exceedingly simplistic explanation it's probably not true there's probably way more nuance than you know a 140 word or 140 character tweet or a 20 second soundbite can possibly let you in on it that's why on many things I don't have an opinion because it can be very difficult to get to gather 
enough information to actually have a, an informed opinion on anything. So be careful. Be careful who you listen to. And yes, if you are the wolf, if you are the free spirit, if you are the enemy of fetters, the non the dweller in the woods, yeah, you're going to have to deal with a pack of dogs. But ultimately, would you rather face a pack of dogs or would you rather face the reality of knowing that you succumb to an untruth? Would you rather be a swine? Yeah. And that's a decision we all have to make. And we have to make that decision every day. Yes. Because one takes a whole lot less energy than, than the other. But then it also might be a lot more difficult to look at yourself in the mirror if you pick the wrong one. Conscientious, so call I him who goeth into God-forsaken wildernesses, and hath broken his venerating heart. In the yellow sands and burnt by the sun, he doubtless peereth thirstily at the isles rich in fountains, where life reposeth under shady trees. But his thirst doth not persuade him to become like those comfortable ones, for where there are oases there are also idols. Hungry, fierce, lonesome, God-forsaken, so doth the lion will wish itself. Free from the happiness of slaves, redeemed from deities and adorations, fearless and fear-inspiring, grand and lonesome, so is the will of the conscientious. In the wilderness have ever dwelt the conscientious, the free spirits, as lords of the wilderness, but in the cities dwell the well-foddered famous wise ones, the draft beasts. So this is going back to the three metamorphoses, how the uh, camel became at last a lion and the lion a child. But in this case, he says he won't believe the donkey until it becomes a lion. Prove you're a lion. Prove to me that you're a lion. No, Prove I'm, to yourself of course, that you're a lion. I'm, I'm going to say, being the uh, resident crackpot Christian of, of said stream, that I think that in certain aspects, Nietzsche throws out the baby with the bathwater here. In certain aspects, he goes and basically says you have to deny the existence of God to be able to do this. Well, I'd say in order to be, you know, more than just a sycophant, if you do believe in God, you should at least be able to have given it some careful thought. And more importantly, God forsaken... A, I, I think that someone working in the Christian tradi tradition could take that as the dark night of the soul, is mm -hmm. what you go through. Which is, in, in a sense, psychologically at least, it has a feeling of God-forsakenness. Well, at least it, 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 it it's transcending this idea that we're just part of this in-group of people that go and say the same things or do these different things and undergo these emotional experiences together but then ultimately having but then ultimately we everything that we actually believe is vacuous right so 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 i think nietzsche is trying to he, of course he claims that religion is vacuous and it's just a tool used by powerful people to manipulate other people but Still, we can understand at least the bathwater that's getting thrown out is this idea that that we aren't critical, that we don't think, that we just put our brain and our conscience on the shelf and do as we're told. Like at least if you're going to do that, Have the sense to be aware of what it is that you're doing. Do it conscientiously. Whatever it may be. And it might be a mistake. Right? There's there's nothing that here that precludes you from making mistakes, but if at least if you make mistakes, they'll be your own. I mean, God knows I've i I've made mistakes in life. I'm sure all of us have. They are our mistakes. And, uh, and we have to own them. And we have to own them. And we have to set off doing what it is that we know is the right thing to do. And interestingly, as we pursue that which is the right thing to do, oftentimes what is right 
becomes Matt? slightly more clear. What's up? Could you read a little bit more of the book and talk? Your narr- uh, the, the, the gracious host has to take a piss. Okay. No problem. So free from the happiness of slaves. So if you're a slave, it's to some extent easy because you don't have to take responsibility. Redeemed from deities is another way of, 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 of abdicating responsibility. Well, this is my master's problem or this is my god's problem. In the wilderness have ever dwelt the conscientious, the free spirits as lords of the wilderness, but in the cities dwell the well-foddered, famous wise ones, the draft beasts. So, of course, they're well-fed, and of course, they're famous. Why? Because they don't question the status quo. They merely tell people whatever it is will make them comfortable and complacent not question the order of things. And certainly an awful lot of the parts of the order of things are good. But it's completely possible to go through life completely asleep. And Nietzsche definitely warns us against that. For always do they draw as asses the people's carts. Not that I, on that account, upbraid them. Serving ones do they remain, and harnessed ones, even though they glitter in golden harnesses. And often have they been good servants, and worthy of their hire. For thus saith virtue, if thou must be a servant, seek him unto whom thy service is most useful. So that uh, that actually goes back to... Um, Uh, the Tree on the Hill and War and Warriors. If you want to, to, to look at uh, chapters 8 or 10, it speaks a little bit more on this, uh, much more deeply on this, especially chapter 10. This, th- this idea that if thou must be a servant, seek him unto whom thy service is most useful. Um, and that, of course, being to the ends that you're trying to achieve. Like You don't need to necessarily be a leader, and you don't need to be a loner, but at least if you're going to follow somebody, do so conscientiously. The spirit and virtue of thy master shall advance by thou being his servant, thus wilt thou thyself advance with his spirit and virtue. And verily, ye famous wise ones, ye servants of the people, ye yourselves have advanced with the people's spirit and virtue, and the people by you, to your honor do I say it, but... The people ye remain for me, even with your virtues, the people with your blind eyes, the people who know not what spirit is. Spirit is life, which itself cutteth into life. By its own torture doth it increase its own knowledge. Did ye know that before? And the spirit's happiness is this to be anointed and consecrated with tears as a sacrificial victim. Did ye know that before? And the blindness of the blind one and his seeking and groping shall yet testify to the power of the sun into which he hath gazed. Did ye know that before? And with mountains shall the discerning one learn to build. It is a small thing for the spirit to remove mountains. Did ye know that before? And the spirit in this case, as very often for Nietzsche, means the conscience. Which Nietzsche does not see as a necessarily bad thing. Ye know only the sparks of the spirit, but ye do not see the anvil which it is in the cruelty of its hammer. Verily ye know not the spirit's pride. But still less could ye endure the spirit's humility, should it ever want to speak. And never yet could ye cast your spirit into a pit of snow. Ye are not hot enough for that. Thus are ye unaware also of the delight of its coldness. In all respects, however, ye make too familiar with the spirit. And out of wisdom have ye often made an almshouse and a hospital for bad poets. 
Ye are not eagles, thus have ye never experienced the happiness of the alarm of the spirit. And he who is not a bird should not camp above abysses. Ye seem to me lukewarm ones, but coldly floweth all deep knowledge. Ice cold are the innermost wells of the spirit, a refreshment to hot hands and handlers. So you have to be hot, red hot, and I think that means passionate for Nietzsche in order to get into the ice-cold innermost wells of the spirit or the conscience or the intellect, perhaps. So cold, so icy that one shrinks back at the touch of him, and for that reason exactly do many think him red-hot. That's what Nietzsche says in Beyond Good and Evil. Perhaps some people have uh, gone deeply enough into this that they appear passionate when really they're just ice-cold. Respectable do ye there stand, and stiff, and with straight backs, ye famous wise ones. No strong wind or will impelleth you. Have ye ne'er seen a sail, crossing the sea, rounded and inflated, and trembling with the violence of the wind? So these famous wise ones stand where they're told to stand, and don't follow the wind, and count themselves independent, but really they're slaves because they can't use the wind. Like the sail trembling with the violence of the spirit, the wind of the spirit, of the intellect, of the conscience, doth my wisdom cross the sea, my wild wisdom. But ye servants of the people, ye famous wise ones, how could, how could ye go with me? Thus spoke Zarathustra. So what do we think of these two chapters together in their culmination, Matt? We've got a few minutes left. Let's see how many is a few. Uh, like five, six. Four, five, six, six, something something like that. Okay. Well, this this idea of following conscience is very important when dealing with a collectivist mindset. When you're told to toe the line, sometimes towing the line is the right thing to do. Because, all right, so, so deliberately doing everything counter to what an authority tells you is easily manipulable because all you have to do is tell someone to do something that is exactly the opposite of what you want. So in one way you're that's that means that one's actions are deterministic upon the actions of or words or actions of another. On the other hand, towing the line all the time uh, leads to the same problem. The, the 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 important thing is that when it is the right thing to do, then go with a herd. When it's not, then go it alone. And you need to be beholden to something other than the opinion of the herd or the ass leading the herd or the ass in lion skin leading the herd um, in order for in order to actually be able to be independent but that oh, it, it, it's not going to be the easy way interestingly this um reminds me of something that was written it's almost half a it's, it's it was over half a century afterward uh, by C.S. Lewis he wrote in the Chronicles of Narnia series there was uh, in one of the last two books there was a, a some uh, it was a gorilla or an ape that wanted to control all of the, the, the beasts of the forest and so he dressed up an ass in the skin of a dead lion and told the ass what to say, and people were a little bit suspicious, but all he did was tell the ass to say things louder, and the ass obeyed, and was able to, at least for a time, convince everyone. But, at least in this story, and as often happens, the ass was revealed, in the end, to be an ass. And... <clears throat> asses in real life do tend to reveal themselves as asses. The thing is that if they are still touting the appropriate party line or what have you, 
they're allowed to gently flow into oblivion as opposed to getting called out and having their lives ruined. But either way, they cease to become relevant. That's why, uh, that's why we cycle through different people. Because, well, as soon as one person becomes... Well, as one person needs replacing, it's easy to go and find another person that's willing to go and take a nice high salary and say the words for a time. I mean, what's a comfortable retirement? Uh, like, uh, re retire comfortably, never have to worry about yourself or your family forever, all in exchange for telling a few lies that you can somehow justify? Why not? Sure, people will eventually see you for what you are. Maybe they won't. But it does make for a cushy, easy life. But maybe not one that's actually... <sighs> conducive to, 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 to seeking after the good and the true and the beautiful. Yeah, you got a downvote a while back. Indeed. Well, I mean, one would kind of expect that to be the case if we're talking about these sorts of things. Indeed. And we're up to six viewers now, but unfortunately the stream is nearly <laughs> over. I want to thank you all for showing up. I encourage you to donate either on Patreon or on my GoFundMe. Uh, it, it means the world to me that people show up to hear me talk, and you guys uh, put a little bit more meaning into my life by showing up and listening. Thank you all. That's all I and my co-host have for now. Until next time.